Professor Wally, just uh, thank you very much for um, uh, the effort you've put in. Uh, it's been uh, very enjoyable uh, doing this with you, as it is every year. Um, I realise it's um, quite demanding and a bit of a shock to the system uh, for uh, some uh, students. Um, I saw uh, James at the other little captain, and actually he was uh, um, not quite as. Uh, the report that had come back to me was that he was a theoretician. That wasn't his work, but anyway. But uh, clearly it was a little shock to his system, and we had a little joke about that, so that's fine. But I do, oh, I am aware that it's quite demanding stuff, and I appreciate the effort you're putting into it. And hope that you found, found it <coughs> rewarding. Um, so the plan today is to uh, look, I'm not going to look in quite such detail at being for self. Um, I will look at parts of it in detail, and then just give you an idea of what's going on. Um, so that you can see how the transition is made to quantity, and then I'll say a little bit about quantity and, and measure, um, just so you can see where the whole thing's going. Uh, and then uh, we can have a break. Uh, I might just survey what I think are some of the principal um, issues that we might think about, and then we can have a discussion uh, about anything really that's come up. I mean, yes, for those that have entered late, I'm sorry about this, but the uh, battery in the smoke alarm or fire alarm appears to be dying. Okay. I think it would be unwise for me to take that out because uh, it, it alerts, but I'll, I'll, I'll let people know. Um, so if, we could, if you don't mind putting up with it, that would be uh, uh, appreciated. Okay, so last time we had a look at Hegel's account of true infinity. Um, and the thing to remember here is that we are in the sphere of quality. So true infinity is a quality of being exhibited by finite things, insofar as they unite, each unites with itself in the other. Bad infinity is infinity that sets itself over against, above, beyond, underneath, wherever you want to be, uh, the finite. But true infinity is exhibited in the course of finitude and by finite being, and it's a quality of being. So we're not dealing here with quantitative infinity. That is quite, well, it's not quite different. It, it, it exhibits something of the same structures we've seen here, but it is different. And indeed, there is also a form of infinity that comes up in measure uh, as well. Um, now, that true infinity, when it first emerges, is understood as a process. Um, as a becoming, and one of the ways of understanding the importance of infinity is just to think of the difference between two kinds of difference. There is the difference that belongs to determinate being, being something, and ultimately being finite, I guess, which is the difference of sort of this and that, A, not A. Initially in the simple form of a straightforward distinction, but then in the form of something and something else. And that's a difference we're all very familiar with. Here's something, here's something else. The relationship between finitude and infinity is not like that. that. If you think it is like that, then you are finitizing the infinite. So the infinite isn't something other than the finite. Now we use the word something in a very loose way often, but as you know, Hegel doesn't, on the whole, use terms like that loosely. So it's very important to think <clears throat> what it would be to think of the infinite as other than the finite, and the fact that we're now not doing that. So the appropriate relationship between the infinite and the finite, as Hegel understands it, is that between process and moments. Where there is a difference, clearly, between process and moments, but they're not other than one another. You can't have a process beyond its moments. The process is the process of the moments, and the moments are the moments of the process. The moments are the bad infinite and the finite, which are both the finite, and the process is the true infinite. Now, we had that distinction right at the start of the logic with becoming, but now it has come in again, and interestingly enough, it's going to disappear again. But it will come back, most obviously, I suppose, later when we get to the sphere of the concept and the idea. Now that process of moment is just a logical structure. It can be exemplified by um, 
a relation of mutual recognition, for example, a relation of love, in which uh, each person is, as it were, a moment of that relation within which they relate to themselves in the other. Um, and it does involve giving up what Hegel calls the sense of being something real and independent, and understanding oneself to be ideal and to be a moment. But that idealism is an ontological structure. It has nothing to do with epistemic idealism. Okay, um, Hegel then claims that infinity takes the form not only of um, a process, but also of immediate self-relating being. And the name he gives to that is being for self. So we've had being within itself, in sich sein, which is a structure of something, being in itself, an sich sein, now we've got being for itself. Being for itself, then, is wholly self-related. It doesn't have another, because it's a form of infinity. But it contains finitude, determinacy within it, as its moment. And the name he gives to that moment is being for one. So being for one is the moment contained within being for self. And being for self has to have that moment, because Infinity has to have finitude within it. So being for one is on one page 159 of the Miller. And again, just going over very briefly what uh, I explained last time, Hegel argues that insofar as being for self contains a moment, and that moment is by definition determinate, so one side of a difference, the question is then what is the other side of the difference? Well, what the other side of the difference is, is what it's a moment of. But what it's a moment of is being for self. But then being for self gets reduced to a moment of the relation to its moment. And so it gets relate, uh, reduced to being for one. So what you have, in fact, is a relationship between moment and moment. Being for one and being for one. So this is 159. Um, he says the moment express this moment expresses the manner in which the finite is present in its unity with the infinite, um, or is an ideal being. It's the section uh, being for one uh, in being for self. If you need to uh, skipping a couple of lines. Now, though this moment has been designated as being for one, there is as yet nothing present for which it would be no one of which it would be the moment. Well, yes, there is. I mean, there's being for self. It's just that 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 gets reduced to another moment. And so that's what he's got in mind here as he goes on to explain here. There is, in fact, nothing of the kind as yet fixed in being for self. That for which something, and here there is no something, would be, whatever that other side as such might be, is likewise a moment, is itself a being for one, not yet a one. Consequently, what we have before us is still an undistinguishedness of the two sides, which may be suggested by being for one. There is only one being for other. Because there is only one, this too is only a being for one. There is only the one ideality of that for which or in which there is supposed to be a determination of the moment. So that for which or in which there is supposed to be a moment is itself a moment of that relation. So that gives us so if we start with the distinction of being for self as opposed to being for one, which is its moment, that gets reduced itself to being a moment. So it becomes being for one as well. So being for self has disappeared. And yet it hasn't disappeared. It's, it's re-emerged in a different form in that what you have here is a relationship of moment to moment, a self-relating in which being for one is itself being for self. And the name that Hegel gives to this new being for self is the one. That term one there, he, in German, is eines. This term here is eins. And they're not the same. So, being, so infinity, in its immediacy, is a form of being, 
proves to be being for self, and that, when it's been thought through, proves to be <coughs> one, being one. So being one, which is not yet a quantitative determination, no, we're still in quality. Being one is a way of being that's different from being finite, being something, being determinate, and so on. Being one is unthinkable for Hegel without the notion of infinity, qualitative infinity. And we'll see this, we see this in the fact that one as such has no other, whereas something has another. Something is limited by that other. One has no other by which it is limited. All right, so we now have the idea of, uh, of uh, one. So let's have a look at um, page 163, the one. Being for self is the simple unity of itself and its moment, being for one. There is before us only a single determination the self-relation of the sublating. Now that's a sentence, or that's a phrase. The self-relating of the sublating. We think, you know, what on earth can that mean? But it's not incomprehensible. Although, if I slightly change that and said it's the self-relating of the sublated moment, then you'd see exactly what he's getting at. A sublated moment, well, every moment is sublated. To be sublated is to be negated partially, to be negated in such a way that you don't disappear altogether. Well, a moment is negated partially in that it's lost its independence. So it's sublated. So what the one is, is the self-relating of the sublated moment, or as he puts it here, the self-relating of the sublating. It's not a very elegant sentence, even by Hegel's standards. And it would be completely incomprehensible if you didn't know the story that we're coming out of. But once you do, it's not incomprehensible. And it actually says exactly, pretty much uh, what uh, he wants to say. So, okay, so there is before us then only a single determination, the self-relation of the sublating. The moments of being for self, i.e. being for one, have collapsed into the undifferentiatedness, which is immediacy or being but an immediacy based on the negating, which is posited as its determination. That's based on the negating of being for one into a being for self. Being for self is thus a being for self, and since in this immediacy its inner meaning vanishes, it is the wholly abstract limit of itself, the one. Okay, so what Hegel's now going to look at is the logic of the one. What is it to be one? Which, remember, then has to be a way of being, a quality of being, that is exhibited by finite things. Finite things, insofar as they are infinite, will be one. So what does it mean to be one? Okay, so we're now going to look on the next page, uh, and there are a series of different things that Hegel highlights that come out of this structure. Uh, the first is that the one is self-relating determinate being. It's determinate being because it involves the moment of negation, the moment of finitude, but it's self-relating. So it's initially not Dasein, not finitude, not something, not other related in the way that finite things are. And insofar as it does not have those characteristics, it's self-relating determinacy as opposed to self-relating determinacy, which is being something. Insofar as the one is not something and is not another, it doesn't change. So if you see in the one in its own self, the last uh, sentence there, consequently the one is not capable of becoming another, it is unalterable. The one is unalterable in the sense that it does not become another. 
It doesn't change. It doesn't change because change belongs to being another, and being another belongs to being finite. That's the first thing to say about being one. Secondly, though, Hegel now highlights the sort of negative moment within uh, the a negative moment within the one, and there are really two aspects to it that he brings out. Um, the first, again, we've got to go back to the idea that just as infinity and finitude are inseparable, so the one and negation, determinacy are inseparable. But in an odd way, because the one has arisen through the fact that the moment of negation, the moment of difference, has actually disappeared. So negation is going to be present in the one in a form, in, if I put it without being sort of ridiculously uh, uh, paradoxical, um, in a form in which it's actually absent. But there is a difference now between that moment of negation just not being there at all and, as it were, being explicitly sort of present as absent. In pure being, there just was no difference. There was, as he says, no diversity either within itself or with respect to another. But pure being didn't have that absence of diversity explicitly in it. It just lacked diversity. But now we've got a one that is a form of pure being, it's just pure being the self, that has to contain negation explicitly within it because the infinite contains the finite within it, and yet it contains it in a form in which it's gone. But that is different from what we found earlier. So how can negation determinacy be present in the one in a form in which it's not present? Well, the first thing Hegel notes is that determinacy, difference, sets something in relation to something else. So the one, by virtue of the moment of determinacy that it contains, relates, as it were, outward to something else. But by, be, be, by virtue of being one, there is no something else for it to relate to. So as he puts it, it goes out, but then comes back in again, reflects back into itself. So this is how he expresses this. So this is in the second paragraph under the one in its own self. Uh, or maybe I'll read the whole thing, actually, just so you've got the whole thing here. Yeah. The one is indeterminate, but not however like being. Its indeterminateness is the determinateness which is a relation to its own self. It doesn't just lack determinacy, it is determinacy, but as self-relating. An absolute determinateness. As the one is in accordance with its notion, a self-related negation, it has difference in it a turning away from itself to another, a negating. It's as if it puts a sign up saying not, keep out, to, what's, uh, to what is other. But there is no other out there for it to keep out. So he goes on, but this movement is immediately turned back on itself because it follows from this moment of self-determining that there is no other to which the one can go and the movement has thus returned into itself. Another way of putting this is to say that the one is explicitly exclusive. It is just the one it is. And it's being exclusive, shutting out anything else, of which there isn't anything anyway, is part of its structure of being one. Whereas being is just being. Being is being is being is being. It's indeterminate. It just is. That's all you can think of. That's all it is. But the one isn't like that. The one is self-relating negation. And that negation involves a turning away from itself to another, which then reflects it back into itself. So that's really very interesting. That the one has this moment of exclusion. Something is one. It's just one. And it's being just one. 
not anything else, because there isn't anything else for it not to be, is part of it being the one. That's what he's got in mind, I think, already in um, uh, the previous page, page 163 under the one, when he describes the one as the abstract limit of itself. A limit, remember, is not being where something else stops. Well, the one has the moment of limit in it. There just isn't anything else for it to stop. So the one is really quite complicated. The one is pure self-relation that is the abstract and absolute limit of itself. So that's the first moment of negation in the one, which makes the one, um, as I say, exclusive in the way that something isn't, for example. Something coexists quite happily with another. Now, when it has a limit, that's, that it does become, if you like, exclusive. But remember the logic of limit. The logic of limit was such that the limit belongs to something, and yet it also doesn't belong to something. So something falls this side of its limit. And so the limit can be thought of as falling between something and its other. The limit now is completely within the one. Because there's nothing outside the one. So the limit falls within the one. All right, but there's another sense in which negation is included in the one. And that is, but it is also present, again, in a form in which it's absent explicitly. And that is that it takes the form of the difference that was there that has now vanished. The one doesn't just involve the complete absence of any moment of difference. It involves the having vanished, the having collapsed of that difference. It is the self-relating that consists in the having vanished of that difference. So how does that undifferentiatedness find a home, as it were, how is it present in the one? It's present as the void. The void is the moment of negation that is an integral part of the one. The one is the one, but it's not just the one, because it's the having vanished of difference. And so the one is void, empty. It's unalterable, it's exclusive, and it's empty. That is initially what it is to be one. So, in the next paragraph, he goes on, um, in this simple immediacy, the mediation of determinate being and of ideality itself, the mediation through being for one, and with it all difference and manifoldness has vanished. There is nothing in it. And this nothing, the abstraction of self-relation, is here distinguished from the being within self itself. It is a positive nothing a nothing that is posited explicitly as a moment within the one. Now, being wasn't <coughs> being vanished into nothing, but it wasn't nothing as being. In fact, in proving to be nothing, being vanishes. But that's not true with the one. The one is explicitly void in being one. It has the two together. So we have, again, the one. To be one is to be self-relating. It's to be unalterable then. It's to be exclusive. It's said to be to shut out what is not it, but there isn't any anything that's not it. And it's also to be void. Okay, now, now there's a series of thoughts which are eventually going to get us to the idea that the one is one of many. And of course the, 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 the section heading here, B, is one of the many. Um, so this is Hegel's account of the one of the many, the derivation of the many, or what, you know, if you were derivative, you say the dissemination, self-dissemination of the one. And the reason why this happens, putting it very simply, is because the one is itself empty, void, but it is also self-relating, affirmative being, and so different from its void. 
The one as one is affirmative, self-relating being. And so it is not its void. It is void, but it's not its void. But now you've got to think, what form does difference take here? The form that difference takes here is one of exclusion, shutting out. And so insofar as the one differs from its void, it must set that void outside it and exclude it from itself. So the very idea of the one includes being void and at the same time excludes its void from its being one. And so it must logically set the void outside it. This is in the next paragraph under one and the void. The one is the void as the abstract relation of the negation to itself. However, the void as the nothing is absolutely distinct from the simple immediacy, the also affirmative being of the one. And since they stand in one and the same relation, namely that of the one, their difference is positive. But as distinct from the affirmative being of the one, the one as the void is outside it. Now what Hegel doesn't say there, what you've got to add in, is that the reason the void is placed outside the one is because that's how the one differs. The one differs by shutting out, by excluding. And so it must exclude its own void. And so we move on to a different conception of the one. Not just the one by itself, but the one that's surrounded by the void. The one that hangs in the void. Being one is standing alone in a void, initially. That is an element, at least, of what it is to be one. If you want to be one, and just one, you're going to isolate yourself. And of course here, we are not exactly in the sphere of the Greek atomists, because the Greek atomists had many ones in the void. But the very idea that one, being one, entails being one within a void is here derived. And this is a good example of the way that Hegel thinks concepts within the history of philosophy can be shown to be more than just historical. They have a logical necessity. There is a big debate, and there's still a big debate, about the sort of the, the priority. So someone like Karin de Boer, as I understand it, and Hartmann too in some moods, seems to think that as it were, history comes first. There is the history which the logic then somehow kind of reconstructs and recapitulates. Personally, I think that's wrong, very wrong. It's rather the other way round. The logic shows the necessity for concepts, but because the logic's not detached from the world we inhabit, those concepts then manifest themselves in history. Not always in exactly the same way they do in the logic, but in a way that's recognizably connected. Now, we can discuss that, and maybe there's, you know, we can talk about which, uh, which is which, um, uh, and there are very strong voices on both sides. Uh, but, but as I'm taking the view that um, uh, the, the logic in that sense is uh, is explaining why certain concepts come up in history. Okay, so we've now got the one and the void. Hegel derives the idea of the many ones in a long and complicated paragraph on page 167. Since it's the last session, we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to just give you the kind of shortened version if that's okay. And the short version should be blindingly obvious to you anyway. Because if the one sets the void outside itself, then what is the void? The void is self-relating emptiness that is other than the one. And that as such has an affirmative being of its own, and so is simply another one. And that is the gist of the argument. It is as simple as that. But the void is not sheer nothing, it is self-relating nothing, self-relating nothing, 
that is excluded from the one and thereby set over against the one as something other than it, as having its own independent self-relation. And so the one sets itself not only relation in relation to a void, but to another one. But that one is also void, also excludes its void, which it sets over against it as a, another one, and that one also, and so on ad infinitum. And so you get an endless multiplication of the one. The many. The one and the many. Note, this is the first time that we have many coexisting. You've got to think back now to understand why that is. Being and nothing can't coexist. Being vanishes in nothing and nothing vanishes in being. So they don't coexist. They're like a light being on or off, but it can't be on and off at the same time. At least in, not in a kind of non-quantum world. Anyway. Um, being and nothing, ex are, are one vanishes in the other. Something and other are bound together as a dyad. Something relates to another. In explaining this, Hegel, and I do too, might refer, refer to others. But strictly speaking, a multiplicity of others are not made necessary by the relation of something to other. All that being something requires there to be is another, the other. That's it. So there's no multiplicity then. I know McTaggart, for example, gets this. He, he thinks there's a plurality of others there already, and there, there isn't. Similarly with a limit. The limit is something that limits its other. There's just the two. Now when you get to the finite, then we do have many in one sense, in that you have an infinite sequence whereby the finite gives rise to the finite, gives rise to the finite, and so on. But remember that this finite arises only when this finite ends. And this finite arises when this finite ends. So the finites don't coexist. They form a sequence in which one arises as the other consigns itself to non-being. So again, we don't have many. But now, we do have many. Because we have one, which as infinite, doesn't end, it's unalterable, it is always the one that it is, which then produces a void, which is another one, which then produces a void, which is another one, and so on. And they do coexist. So here, we have many, for the first time in the logic. There is a book by Andrew Haas called Hegel and Multiplicity, which I've finally got a copy of, but I've never, not actually read. So I don't know exactly what he says. Having skimmed it, though, it looks to me, although I've got to be careful, and I apologize to Andrew if I get this wrong, that he doesn't see this and thinks that multiplicity comes in a little bit earlier. It doesn't. And this is really important, that what Hegel's trying to think here is not only what is it to be one, but what is it to be many? And the thing about being many is that being many involves being many ones, at least here. You can't have many unless you've got one. Because to be many is to be the many of many ones, at least as, here, as it's here understood. Right, that's the first thing to think about, that, that, that being manifold, to use Kant's term, requires the form of the one. Uh, I wanted also just to say a little bit about the distinction between Hegel and Plato on the one, although strictly speaking it's not Plato on the one, it's Parmenides in Plato's dialogue. Um, engaging in certain paradoxes that are partly designed to confuse Socrates. Um, but nonetheless, it's, this is what people refer to as Plato's theory of the one and the many. And it's interesting to see uh, the 
difference between uh, the two. So, um, I didn't have time to copy this, I'm afraid, but, but you can look at it uh, up yourself. Um, it's in Plato's Parmenides, it's giving the, uh, um, the page numbers on the side, it's 142B through E. 142B through E. And I'll read you what uh, Parmenides says, and then just show you the, the difference, because there's an interesting difference between the two. Um, so, Parmenides says, and he's, he's got an, an interlocutor uh, here as well. So, uh, Now, consider the first point. If one is, can it be a not partake of being? No, it cannot. Then the being of one will exist, but it will not be identical with one, for if it were identical with one, it would not be the being of one, nor would one partake of it. But the statement that one is would be equivalent to the statement that one is one. Now it's worth noting here that in this account of the one and the many, what Plato stroke Parmenides starts with is not just the one, but with the statement the one is. So this is Plato, uh, and Hegel will be good for uh, in a minute. So, the being of the one will exist, but it will not be identical with the one, because if it were identical with the one, it would not be the being of the one. Do you agree? Certainly. In the belief that one and being differ in meaning, most assuredly. Let us again say what will follow if one is. And consider whether this hypothesis must not necessarily show that the one is of such a nature as to have parts. And of course, that's so the, so the many come in, in Plato's account, as parts of the, of the one. How does that come about? In this way. If being is predicated of the one, which exists, and unity is predicated of being, which is one, and being and the one are not the same, but belong to the existent one of our hypothesis, must not the existent one be a whole of which the one and being are parts? Inevitably. And shall we call each of these parts merely a part, or must it, insofar as it is a part, be called a part of the whole? A part of a whole. Whatever one then exists is a whole and a part. So the idea is, and then that just reduplicates itself, and so you then get the one comprising many, many parts. So the one and the many, the one multiplies itself by dividing itself into many parts. So for Plato, you have the one is, you have the one that is, which is really the same as being that's one. And I suppose you could say, give that the one is a form, and all the forms are forms of being, that the, the, the being belongs to it. But there's a difference between being one and being itself. Or the difference between one and being. Although it's hard to say. I've just said it. The difference between being one and being. I've obviously got being on the side of one already. So there's a difference in identity here. And that is the presupposition, really, of the account that Parmenides is giving here. If you highlight that difference, then you have one, and you have being. But to be one is to have being, and to be being is to be one. And so you can see how the thing then reduplicates itself. So the way that Parmenides stroke Plato gets the many out of the one is through the difference which is assumed from the very start between one and being. But note that that difference, as a difference, as a negative, isn't built in a way to either of them. The one is just affirmative one, and being is just being. So the moment of difference doesn't belong to either one of them, and yet it's presupposed in order to get the whole thing going. 
And so you could say, to the extent that these are assumed to be different in the first place, they're also assumed to be many. So there isn't really a derivation of the one of the many and one of the many from uh, from Parmenides here. One is already assumed to be different from its own being at the very start, and therein lies the root of the many. Hegel is different. Hegel, you just have the one first of all, and the void is internal to the one. You have no difference in that sense from anything else. Or as you say, in going out, it just kind of goes out, but then it just comes back in again to itself. So it's just self-related. But there is an internal difference between the one and the void, so that <coughs> void goes out there. But then that moment of negation is inherited throughout the course of the logic, and is an explicit part of being one, whereas here, the moment of negation or difference is not an explicit part of being one. It's just an unjustified assumption. <clears throat> well, at least that's, or it's just an assumption, anyway. For Plato, there's just the assumption that to be one is to be one, and yet one and being are different. Hegel has the moment of the negative now, in one itself, for reasons that have been derived, that negative has to be expelled, but that forms another one, and that expels, and so on. So here you get the one and the many emerging through a combination of the two aspects of the one. It's being void, and it's being one. It's being one is it's being void, and yet it's different from its own being void. But that's now an internal derived difference as opposed to an assumed difference. And it involves an explicitly negative moment within the one, whereas here you have no negative moment within the one. And it means that what you get with Hegel is a genuine many, many ones, whereas what you get with Plato are many parts of one one. So there are differences, and the differences are instructive. And they reflect the fact that Plato, of course, being a follower of Parmenides, doesn't, can't think of the negative as being an intrinsic constitutive feature of being. But Hegel's a dialectical thinker, so the negative is part of being right from the very start. I'm sure there's more one can say about this, but anyway, that this is a you know a big substantial metaphysical issue. And it's interesting, and one of the reason I'm going through this is I, I appreciate you haven't had time to prepare it in advance. I'm sorry about that. But what I want to show is that. Despite the complexities of Hegel's logic, it is possible to find arguments within it that you can bring into relationship with other classic arguments in the history of philosophy. I doubt you'll find, except by certain Hegelians, anything on Plato and Hegel on the one and the many. Klaus Dusing, I think, has written on this, but he's Hegelian. I don't think you'll find many non-Hegelians engaging with it, but why not? It's a perfectly intelligible and actually very interesting relation. And after all, the phenomenon of the many is a pretty important one. We live in a world in which there are many things. Where does manyness come from? If Hegel's right, manyness doesn't come from just being something. It doesn't come from being limited. It comes from being one. You can't be many without one. You can't be one without many. Right, now we can come back to this later, because um, I want to sort of press on a little bit. Um, but... Um, and as I say, the, 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 the Plato's Parmenides you can um, look at by yourself at, at some point. Um, now, this movement in Hegel, whereby the one who expels its own void outside it as another one, is the movement Hegel calls repulsion. Repulsion. As we'll see, the moment of attraction comes in in a minute. Obviously, repulsion and attraction are familiar, um, or may, may not be familiar, but they, they, they may be familiar to you from Kant's um, metaphysical foundations of natural science, in that they are regarded by Kant as sort of constitutive moments of gravity. Hegel is thinking repulsion and attraction, which I haven't explained yet, I'll come to that in a minute, thinking about repulsion here, 
as generated by the structure of the one. And so it here has nothing at all to do with space, matter, and so on. Or rather, if there is a connection, it's going to be that space, which is the continuity of different here's, itself involves the one. So the repelling and attracting of the one itself informs space, and so grounds gravity in the very structure of space itself. But its ultimate logical heritage is from being one. Okay, uh, time is passing, so I want to just go over a few uh, further thoughts. Repulsion is, is named explicitly on 167. On 168, which is after he's uh, derived the becoming of many ones, and then there's another paragraph, uh, the one after that, uh, this repulsion as the positing of many ones, um, leads into a discussion of two different kinds of repulsion. And there has to be two different kinds of repulsion for the following reason. There has to be the first movement of repulsion, whereby the many ones are, as it were, generated logically. But remember, what is it to be one? To be one is to be unalterable. To be that which can't be generated. And so the repulsion that generates the one has, has to then mutate into a second repulsion, which is actually the holding of bay, a holding of bay of ones that are one. Because if you're going to think of the one as one, you can't think of it as generated. Because it's unalterable. It's just purely self-related. So this is what he's getting at in um, 168. First of all, we must establish what determinations are pos possessed by the many ones. Um, and he talks about the process whereby the one repels itself from itself, etc. But then he goes on and says that the ones are presupposed relatively to one another. Why are they presupposed? Well, because they have to be, as it were, Generated as not generated. This anticipates and looks forward to the move in, in essence later when he goes from positive reflection to external reflection. And it's an, an, an idea that Hegel comes back to. The thought that something can be posited or produced as not produced. Generated as not having been generated. And it means that the one, one's, have both to be related and unrelated at the same time. And indeed, the nature of their relation is that they are unrelated. And their not being related isn't just an absence of a relation between them. It is the manner of their relation. Now, if, and this is completely forbidden, okay? Don't you dare say I believe this. If you anthropomorphize this, just to make it a little bit more intelligible, and think of the one in terms of sort of human indifference. The one is just enclosed on itself. You just live in your own world as the one that you are. That is a way of differing from others. Indifference, turning one's back on somebody, is a way of differing from them, of relating to them. Only it denies any explicit relation. So the one, as he goes on further down the page there, are related in the manner of unrelatedness. And the nature of that unrelatedness, which is their relatedness, Hegel says, is the void between them. So here we do now have a sort of Greek uh, atomist position. Although, interestingly enough, Hegel goes in then to talk about Leibniz. And you can see how like the monadism would be related to this. Okay, and I am going to speed up, I'm afraid, rather, uh, because uh, I'm going to make sure this is all clear. So now we have um, a, let me just do this kind of more uh, clearly. Now we have um, not a vanishing series, but which is where that involves generation, 
which also, in a sense, has to not have the moment of generation in it, where they just are many in relation to one another. So that gives us the many ones, each holding the others at bay, although the fact that there are many in the first place is itself due to the logic of the one. But note that each one is exactly the same one. And so the one relates to itself in the other one. And each one does this. In fact, what you have throughout this series is simply a self-relating of the one. The one relates to itself in that one, and in that one, and in that one, and in every one. Because they are absolutely identical. Something and other aren't absolutely identical. Okay, something, the other is another something, but it's also another something. But each one is the same one. And so what you have with many ones is the continuity, the self-relating of being one. And that unity Hegel names attraction. So repulsion generates many, but the process through which the many prove to be the many of one self-relating one is attraction. And so repulsion and attraction are inseparable from one another. And in fact, he then goes on to say that you couldn't have repulsion without attraction because if things don't draw together, that they can't hold one another at bay. But similarly, you couldn't have attraction without repulsion, because if there were no moment of repulsion, attraction would just collapse together into a sort of singularity, I guess. Just, you know, boom, just sort of disappear like that. The only way you can have attraction, things coming together as one, is if they hold themselves apart. But the only way they can hold themselves apart is if they're actually pulling together as one. There is more going on, but I won't go through it. Now, we're on the verge of quantity. So, quantity arises, Hegel thinks, when attraction and repulsion are thought explicitly as each involving the other. So, when repulsion is the repulsion of those that attract, and when attraction is the attraction of those ones that repel one another, then Hegel gives different names to those. He calls um, uh, uh, the first, the repulsion of those that attract, discreteness in continuity, and the other is continuity with, the, with, with discreteness. And that gives you the first two determinations of quantity. So quantity is the continuity of ones, units, that are quite separate from one another and self-enclosed. Kant would say right, the, the unity of homogeneous units. They're homogeneous, they're continuous, they form a unity, but they're separate, they're discrete. And it's that structure that is the basic structure of quantity. So quantity is a different kind of quality that's made necessary by the structure of being one. So to the extent that a finite thing is one, and one of many, it must also have quantity. <clears throat> now, very briefly, quantity is, is a long section. It includes long uh, um, footnotes as well. Um, quantity has another, a number of features that, um, that I will just mention very briefly so you've got an idea uh, of what's involved. The principal one is self-externality. So, the one falls outside, excludes the other one, which excludes the other one. What it is to be one is to be discrete, to exclude other ones, but also then to exclude oneself. So you get this paradoxical idea of self-externality, being external to oneself, which, you know, for many people would just be incomprehensible. But Hegel thinks that is the kind of fundamental principle of quantity. It's being that is external to itself. And that needs to be taken in two ways. 
First, the very structure of quantity itself involves self-external ones. But quantity as a way of being is itself external to quality. And the mark of that is that you can change the quantity of something without changing its quality. Something can get bigger or smaller, more or less intense, without changing the quality of what it is. But if it changes its fundamental quality, it stops being what it is and becomes something else. So Hegel's favorite example is take, I suppose this reflects the society in which he was living, forest, meadow, Wald und Wiese. If you have a, a meadow and you plant a whole lot of trees, it becomes a forest and it stops being a meadow. Or if you have a forest, you chop down all the trees and grow grass, then you, it stops being a forest and becomes a meadow. So change the quality and you change what you've got. But the forest can have more trees. It can get bigger. The light can get brighter. The red can be brighter and still red. So there is a fundamental externality within quantity that makes it a quality that is external to the very quality of something. So self-externality governs the whole logic of quantity, and it's part of what makes it actually quite difficult. Um, right, maybe I'll just add a few uh, thoughts here to show you how the rest of it goes. So, we've now got, we're now then in a different space of logic, the space of quantity, which remember is governed and determined by the one, the unit, which is itself a form of being for self. Okay, so you have a unit, a unit, a unit, a unit, a unit, which each of which is discrete, but they form a continuity. They form one quantity. Hegel thinks a number of things follow from this. First of all, quantity has to be divisible. But only divisible, not always already divided. If the moment of continuity were not there, it would be always already divided, and we'd be in sort of Zeno's world. But discreteness is only one aspect of quantity. Quantity is discreteness plus continuity. And insofar as it is continuous in its discreteness, it is divisible, not always already divided. And so Hegel thinks Aristotle was right against Zeno. Quantity has the potential in Aristotle's uh, way of thinking to be divided indefinitely, but it's not always already divided, whereas Zeno's paradoxes assume that it is already divided. And there was a debate in, you know, with Pierre Bale and, and Leibniz and others around, around this, so this was still a sort of live issue. Hegel's very much on the side of Aristotle, and he thinks he can derive the divisibility, not the dividedness, of quantity from the fact that quantity is both continuous and discrete. He then argues that, that, that just as being takes the form of something, so quantity as such has to take the form of quantitative somethings, quanta, units, which for various reasons he thinks take the form of number, and so you get quantity taking the form of number. But what I'm interested in is what happens at the end of the section on quantity. Quantity begins with the idea of being for self and the one as self-external. It ends with the moment of being for self coming back again in an explicit form. And it does so through the phenomenon of what he calls the ratio of powers. So he has a whole derivation of quanta, numbers, ratios, both direct ratios, inverse ratios, and then he ends with an account of what he calls the ratio of powers, which is just squaring something. So if you have you know, x, and then you have x squared, that relationship of powers, Hegel thinks, is not accidental. It's built into the very structure of quantity. And what it exhibits is the coming back of being for self. Why? <clears throat> because x, whatever it is, just relates to itself in its own power. Because its power is just 
itself multiplied by itself. So obviously there's a difference if you have 3 and then 3 squared, which is 9. 9 is not the same number as 3, so there's, got, there's a difference there. But 9 is just 3 by itself. 3 for itself. So being for self, the fact that quantity begins in being for self, but then ends in explicit being for self, makes necessary relations of powers. And further powers, he thinks, don't, don't make any difference philosophically. These powers then play a hugely important role in the sphere of measure. And they play a role in what Hegel regards as fundamental laws of nature. Not everything that we regard as a law of nature, Hegel thinks is a law of nature. There are very few laws that he takes to be really laws inherent in nature. Galileo's law of fall, for example, is one of them, and Kepler's laws are inherent in nature, and they both, oh, well, there's three laws, let's see, Kepler, the third one, involve powers. So, what Hegel's trying to do here is show not only that quantity is inherent in being, but that ratios of powers are inherent in being, so we would expect when we go to nature to find ratios of powers governing, for example, the motion of the planets or the way that bodies fall. That moment of being for self that we find here is, of course, the culmination of quality. So Hegel argues that when you have a number relating to its own power, you have a number that exhibits qualitative being for self. So the idea here is just as quality gave rise to quantity, so eventually quantity gives rise to quality. That gets you the thought that quality and quantity are united, they're inseparable. Now take that in its immediacy, as Hegel always does, what is the immediate unity of quality and quantity? It is the measure of a thing. So the measure of a thing is the quantity, some immediate quantity, that is identical with and constitutive of the immediate quality of something. And measure, Hegel thinks, is the real truth of being. What it is to be properly is to have a measure. And the measure is that quantity that enables everything to be what it is. So quantity has a, an ambiguous relation to things. Things, quantity is indifferent, external to things. I can get bigger, smaller, and still be who I am. But there's a measure to everything too, such that if it exceeds a certain quantity, it changes its quality. A favorite example would be boiling water. There's a range of quantities within which water is water. Go beyond a certain quantitative limit, and you've no longer got liquid anymore, you've got a gas, or you've got a solid. <coughs> or another example Hegel gives is of states. Small states can have republican constitutions, but you get beyond a certain size, and that no longer becomes possible qualitatively. Measure is really complicated and absolutely fascinating. Um, and of course, it's a Greek idea that Hegel says the moderns have largely lost sight of. He says it's not there in Kant, it's not there in Spinoza, but the Greeks had an idea of a measure, and that's the appropriate quantity, as it were, for something to have to be what it is. And Hegel's now showing this is essential, this has come back. Um, Okay, I think I'm going to stop at that point um, and um, suggest that we have a just a quick break if, uh, for just a couple of minutes to stretch the legs, uh, and then we can come back for a, a bit of a discussion about uh, all of this.